All right. Well, hey, it's uh, Greg Myroth. I'm back here with another episode of, of Pottery Conversations. And today I have uh, Frank Norman. You know, Frank is a friend, Weller collector, book author, and e extensive researcher of, of Weller pottery. Um, Frank, welcome to our conversations today. Thanks, Greg, and good morning. Yeah, yeah. Hey, um, I want to jump right into things because I know there's a lot that you have to talk about, uh, particularly as it relates to Weller pottery. But one of the things I want you to talk about for a minute, if you don't mind, is I, you know, I knew you had a, a farm that you had restored. Um, what I didn't know when I was going through your first book was I did not realize that you were able to populate that farm with, with period animals. So would you, would you mind just like sharing a little bit about that? Because I think that gives a little insight to you and your, you know, the, your whole uh, philosophy of life. I thought it was very, very cool. Sure. Um, yeah, when we found this home, um, it was in dire need of restoration. We were all, we've always been into the period homes. We looked at the like 18th century, 19th century homes, and we found this, this diamond in a rough that needed a lot of restoration. And we slowly worked through the process to restore it and get it back to its original state, which was a 1770s log cabin with a 1790s stone summer kitchen. And once we finished restoring the house, then we started working on the barn. The barn was covered in aluminum siding. Um, we ended up, you know, stripping all that. We got a cherry picker. Then we got the barn in order. And, you know, after a while, then we started thinking, you know, this is a period farm. We took such time and detail to, to get period, um, you know, furnishings inside, period hardware, everything period to this house. So what if we wanted animals, what kind of animals would we purchase? So we said, well, we should have the original animals that would have been on this farm in 1770. And typically they would have been the ones that came over on the wooden ships with the settlers when they first came to the country. So I started doing a lot of research into the, the different um, societies out there. There was a society for the preservation of poultry antiquities. There's American Livestock Breed Conservancy. So I started talking to those people and, and started learning about what type of animals should be on this period farm, 1770s period farm. And they provided a lot of insight. And then it was a matter of getting in touch with the proper breeders that were breeding these animals, because most of them were on the endangered species list. Um, yeah. Very few of them left in the U.S. And we we hooked up with some really good people. It actually, the president of the one club was about an hour and a half away from me. And he came out to the farm and looked over the farm because we wanted to bring in these geese that were geese that were called Old English or cotton patch geese, depending on what port they came into, the north or the south. Okay. And there was only supposedly eight of them left in the wow. U.S. And wow. the, the individual that was trying to propagate them down in Texas, he was 88 years old and he wasn't wasn't being very successful. So we set up a, a, an appointment. The, the president of the club came out, took a look at the farm and said, yeah, you'd be the perfect candidate to take on these geese. So that was the first project we took on. And I flew them in from Texas. We, you know, flew them in in, in, in cages from, on the airplane. And we started with the geese. Then we got into chickens that were back to the time of the Romans. Um, but all these all these breeds came over on the wooden ships with the settlers. And then we also got into Narragansett turkeys, which was really the first breed, standard breed of turkeys in the U.S. Narragansett meaning, you know, Narragansett, Rhode Island. That's where yeah. they first were founded. Um, and then finally, we got into Lester Longwool sheep. Um, they were a sheep that George Washington brought over. He had Hog Island sheep, and okay. he wanted to have a meatier, um, thicker wool type sheep. And they, Colonial Williamsburg was doing a satellite program, and we got involved with that, and we got Lester Longwool sheep. So that, we figured at that point that was enough to try and handle with you know, both working full time, you know, yeah. and, and also pottery collecting and, and everything else that we were doing, yeah. always being one of those 110%, you know, go, go, go kind of guy. So yeah. I got involved in a lot, but that, to answer your question, that's how we got involved with those animals. Yeah, that was, that was such a cool story. And, um, and I'm not just saying this, Frank, honestly, your book, that first, book one, I haven't, I haven't read all book two, but book one, that's one of the that's one of the few pottery books that I just sat and just kind of read from cover to cover. And one of the, and I thought that was an amazing part of the story. And I want, I wanted you to talk about that a little bit because I think that 
shows a little bit of insight into the detail and the thoroughness you would put into the research that you've done in both books one and book two. Um, so I thought that was really, really cool. The other thing I loved about book one was how you told the story of like acquiring some of these pieces. I'd never seen that in a book before. And I, and I thought like, as I was reading that, I thought, um, you know, this is interesting. It's hard to get people to sit down and go through a, a, a more detailed, like it's almost like a textbook, right? A lot of these pottery books are kind of like textbooks or they're just picture books, right? So your, your book, I think the first book in particular, I thought was really, really cool how you told the story of like, and there, there's a lot to be learned there from the, the length of time it took to acquire some of these pieces and the, the, the steps you would take to travel somewhere to go get something and then to make a decision that, like the decisions that people have to go through, like why this vase versus that vase? I'm going to put my money into this or that. I'm going to try to decide how much of this one's going to be. And the thought process that we all go through to some extent, I thought it was really cool the way you shared that. And I think, I think that uh, it was, should be a really, it's a really interesting book that people should take the time to look at. So um, I guess, you know, if you don't mind, speak a little bit. How'd you guys get, how'd you get started on Weller and, and why was it, why was Weller the pottery that you chose? It really started back in 1988, and I had a brother-in-law and his wife come out from Ohio to visit us. And at that time, you know, we weren't into antiques at all, and they were doing antique shows, antique auctions, you know, a lot of different venues with antiques. And they were coming out for the weekend. They said, do you guys know of any places around like antique shops or auctions or flea markets or something we could go visit that would be fun when we come out there so we started looking into it and here we found out that we were you know very close to adamstown pennsylvania which at the time was called you know the antique capital of the world so there was a lot of resources in the area there's a lot of auctions local auctions there were a lot of antique shops um so when they came out, we had lined some things up. We, we did have an auction lined up, a flea market. We had a couple antique shops and just getting out there. And, and I think it was the, the, the auction scenario that was just so profound to me to sit in that auction and yeah. see that you could buy some of the stuff that I thought was really cool. And yeah. it was at lower prices. And at the time we were furnishing the house and we were looking for furniture. And that was another period home. And we, we looked at like antique oak furniture, quarter saw and oak furniture. And here, this beautiful oak furniture was going really reasonable. We're like, well, let's let's furnish the house with through auction. So anyway, we got started into auctions. And and once we got started, I was addicted. I mean, it was it was really, you know, a, like I said, a profound experience that just got me hooked very quickly. Um, and then I started spreading out into other areas. And I think I was collecting, I think, everything possible <laughs> during my lifetime of collecting. I started yeah. in Majelica and Fiesta and and lamp yeah. lamps and redware and so on and so forth. But then I first started, I, I bought the first pottery I bought was Roseville because I heard so much about Roseville. And I bought a few pieces of Roseville. And, you know, then when I got it home, you know, I looked at it and was like, yeah, you know, this is kind of cool. And so I, I started looking at other auctions for pottery. And there was an auction that was about 45 minutes away from me up in the Poconos that had a, a nice listing of pottery. They didn't have pictures, but the description sounded pretty cool. Um, yeah. So we went up to that auction and I went in and I saw this piece of Balden and it was, you know, the natural Balden, not the blue Balden with the organic colors and whatever. And I just fell in love with it and I had no idea what it was, but I knew at that point that I had to take that home. So I really sat back in the auction and really waited for that to come up. I was afraid to spend money on anything else because um, I had to take that piece home. And I finally purchased it and then started researching it and trying to find out what pottery is this because I really, really like this pottery. And I think at that point I found Huxford's book and because there wasn't a lot published at that time. And in Huxford's book, I found, you know, the Balden piece. Yeah. And, and looking through that book, I'm like, wow, this is so much more interesting than Roseville. Yeah. And not, not to say anything about Roseville collectors, you know, the, the Roseville's, you know, got its pluses too. It's pretty cool pottery. Yeah. But it just to me, I just had an affinity to Weller at that point and really, really was attracted to a lot of the pieces, especially the Hudson's, the Ocean's. Um, they really, really were exciting to see those in the book. Yeah. Um, so that's how I got into collecting Weller. And from there, it was just really focusing on Weller and going to auctions. And a lot of people at that time 
since there wasn't marked Weller, a lot of marked Weller didn't know what Weller was. So you could go to local auctions. And since there were so many in the area, I was able to pick up some pieces that people didn't even know what pottery it was. Yeah. So what part, so, you know, in your story is, I have kind of a similar story with Van Briggles, how I started. It's kind of somewhat similar situation going to an auction and starting that and researching everything I could with Van Briggle. Um, but I guess one thing, you know, you mentioned Roseville, you know, Van Briggle, Rookwood, um, those potteries, there's much more clear documentation on the history, right? You get into Weller and there's a lot more unknown. So when you were collecting, like, so at some point you kind of like, man, this book, this book says this, but this is, this doesn't, this doesn't jive with what I've just purchased. You know, like they, you found a, you certainly, cause I've seen this, you found many inconsistencies with Weller based on what the book said, with based on what you collected or saw the markings that you saw. So when did you get to the point to decide that you're going to write a book? Yeah, I think, you know, collecting the pieces, like you said, um, some of it wasn't marked and whatever. And it was difficult sometimes to discern, you know, what I was collecting. And this kind of relates to beginning collectors today. They, they yeah. don't see something marked. They don't know what it is. Exactly. And, and it was a challenge to me to try and learn a lot of different potteries to, to find out, you know, understand well or get as much information as I could on Weller. So, um, you know, I was out there many times myself questioning, should I buy this? I don't know. It doesn't, I don't, it does not mark, but it looks like Weller. And I look in the Huxford book and it wasn't in the Huxford book. And then you just get the feel that, you know, this has got to be Weller. It just has that Weller feel to it or whatever. So, you, you know, you go through that process until you start doing more and more research and getting out there and, and seeing more shows. And, you know, then I got out to, to Zanesville and Pottery Lovers and boy, was that an eye-opening experience. I had never seen so much pottery in my life and just was, you know, like the rest of them, my first time there, you know, you're up 24 hours, you can't sleep. You're yeah. doing <laughs> buying pieces at three in the morning and, you know, <laughs> talking to people and learning and learning and learning. And, and you know, that's what really got me into to collecting it. And, and as far as the book, um, I, I think what spurred me on with the book is that when I, as I met people and networked and talked to people, we, we always sat down and talked and I was always sharing stories about, oh, you see that piece there? And I would tell the story behind it. And, yeah. and I forget who it was. A friend at one time said, you know, your stories are so interesting. Why don't you just write a book on them? I, they said people would really enjoy those stories. And I said, yeah, that's a thought. And, um, you know, I, I, thought about it for a while and then eventually said, you know, kind of started looking at all the pieces and putting all the stories together. I'm like, you know what? I have enough that I could write a book, you know, with yeah. that being a, a big part of it or a, a few chapters on it. And also I came from a teaching background. I, I had a, a teaching credential um, okay. in California. I went through a five-year teaching program and I, and I like the thought of giving back. So I wanted to write a book to help beginning collectors like myself when I started going co collecting and not understanding Weller um, because of the, the misnomers and the mismatches and the changing of names and, and what, all the other things that go with Weller. Um, so I wanted to kind of write a book to kind of teach individuals um, yeah. what I went through collecting pottery and also include in it a lot of tips like you know how to how to clean pottery, how how to detect repairs. You know the the verbiage that was used. Everybody had a lingo. It's like you know what's a flea bite. You know I had no idea what a flea bite was. Yeah. So I kind of put vocabulary in there, and then then I had a collection at that time that I thought was you know worthy of putting in the book to help them understand you know this is Weller and and see the variances with Weller and the bottoms and 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 glazes and everything else. And and I think that was the main um you know focus on writing that book yeah you know the other thing about the book like with the talking about the steps to detect repairs and the kind of the glossary of terms um so i have an engineering background so i appreciated the way you wrote because it's just it's straightforward it's to the point it, it's helpful information that uh, that collectors can use for sure so so that's really interesting funny thing it was because like i would I was sitting there reading the book because I've had people say to me, I said, well, Greg, you should, you know, my, my store, my stories are always the pottery collection. When we go to buy these collections and we get in these houses and there's 3000 pieces of Van Briggle or there's, you know, 1500 pieces of Roseville that have been stored away for 30 years. And the stories of the people that we meet and I've had numerous people say to me like, Greg, you should write a book about all that. And I thought, I'm not going to write a book about that. I don't, I, and then I, when I was reading your book, I thought, well, this is, this is what Frank did on his, 
on his collecting journey. My problem is I didn't keep anyway. I have no good records. I mean, you were you were amazing and kind of detail like the. I mean, you're telling the stories of how you're looking at this piece and it got away and it came back later and the steps you went to to get it. So it, you did a really cool job with that. So I guess uh, moving on, one of the things I wanted to ask you about, I think, for like the new collector that's maybe starting out that is interested in Weller, like what would you what would be your advice to like you know maybe glaze lines to look at um just like what would be what would be some of the lines that you think are most interesting maybe aren't as as well known or maybe like just that you just think hey there's there's definitely uh there's definitely good value here for the quality uh what, what would be some thoughts you have there yeah I, I think the first thing i would say to that beginning collector is you know a lot of people when they start collecting it's like volumes they want to buy 10 yeah. pieces instead of one good piece and i would say you know to that collector you know, look for the best piece in the best condition. And, you know, I was always a perfectionist. And like I said, it's a double-edged sword. But at the same time, it really helped me when I was collecting and, and had more finances and could start trading up. I always could sell the pieces I had originally bought because they were always in great condition. You know, they had the best artistry that I thought was available. Um, I started, you know, looking towards certain artists that I knew were really good artists like Timberlake. And you could just, you could just identify them by yeah. looking at the pot. So I always collected, you know, the best piece I could find and tried to stay away from buying 10 pieces and buy, would buy one. But today, um, for that, that collector and looking at the Weller lines that are out there and available, I, I really think there's been a downturn in some of the early artist decorated pieces like the, the, the Oceans and, and the Hudson's. I, I can't really, sometimes I can't believe when I look on eBay and see a piece that's, you know, a Timberlake piece and it's thick, slip decorated, just, just beautifully done. Art, the artistry is wonderful on it. And the price, I look at it, and it's like one third of what the price when I was purchasing yeah. these pieces. Um, yeah. So I think those those lines are are really depressed at this point, and 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 it tends to ebb and flow with and, and over the times. I mean, I've been collecting thirty seven years, and I've seen prices dip, and I've seen them come up. And you know, I've always tried to buy pieces sometimes, even if they weren't my favorite lines or whatever when the, the prices dipped and they always tended to come back so then I could sell them at that point and buy something else that I like more um, but but that's where I'd steer the artist decorated pieces yeah. and and the ocean and, and and Hudson are two that I would mention yeah you know and just to kind of piggyback off that it, I couldn't agree with you more on that because I feel like like Sicard is a line that is pretty hot Right. Like I, we, we see, we get really competitive prices. Uh, I mean, we see that like rivaling, um, you know, good Rookwood. I mean, the, the Sakar price is very strong. Hudson, the ocean prices, not as much. I mean, you see this, some rare occurrences. And one thing that, you know, I've tried to do a little more is like look outside of just comparing a Hudson to another Hudson. And what I think is interesting about that, when you start looking and you compare your Eoceans and your Hudsons to, to Rookwood, uh, some, some of the, the Rookwood scenic vellums and the prices that you're seeing on some of the vellum glazed Rookwoods, it's like, and you start, when you set those pieces side by side, is there that much difference? And it's just, you know, I, that, that become, and obviously that's beauties in the eye of the beholder with that. But I think, I, I, I tend to think that you, what you, your comments are, are very, well spoken and I do I do tend to agree that those lines are probably undervalued and at some point we'll we'll see an increase to that. Um, and just to just to comment on Sicard, you know that's that's another line and it's always been desirable. I mean rarely do you see that dip because there's always Sicard collectors out there. Um, and you know there's there's a in my opinion there's a good Sicard and then there's a not so good Sicard yeah. and it depends you know you see some of these Sicards that I wouldn't even consider purchasing and they're still obtaining these really high prices and I think people are just buying it because it says Sicard and yeah. it's what's associated with Sicard and Tiffany um, yeah. but, you know a really good Sicard piece has that wonderful thick glaze on it um, it's got beautiful artistry and whatever the subject matter is and it's colorful it's like it's got all the colors of the rainbow and some yeah. of them are so thin glazed that you could basically almost see the the clay through it yeah. and, and they still bring these incredible prices and, and I, a lot of them are really overfired 
a lot yes. of them were fired too, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. You know, um, this is so, you know, I, I mentioned that I have done these interviews with uh, Tony Olson and Mark Latta. And one of the things, and this will be the third time that we've that we said this, at least with, with each of those conversations, and they all kind of said it in their own way. And you said, you basically said the same thing. It's like, and I like the way Tony said it. And I, I won't quote him exactly, but when he was talking about UND, he's like, just because you flip the pot over, it's got a UND stamp. If it looks like his basic, I think he said, if it looks like a turd, trust your judgment. It's probably a turd, right? And I think it's the same thing with Sicard. And a lot of, like, I, I do think you're right. Like, you'll see people, oh, just because it's Sicard, well, it's worth a lot. And that's where, you know, at some point, I, I would like to talk a little bit more about kind of good, better, and best and the evaluation of particular glaze lines. And we may not get there today, but, it's, but I do think that's a conversation that's worth having, particularly when you look at, the variability in Weller, because I think it's fair, right? Weller maybe didn't have as good a quality control as some of the other makers. So you see a wider range of, of pot of quality, right? Like you see some just, when I, when you start looking at some of the stuff in your book, it's like, like, this is just exceptional compared to what the standard typical market market available example that you see, you know, like normally to today. Um, so I think there's, there's, um, there's a wide range of quality there and helping to define, you know, what goes into that is, is, is beneficial too. So is there anything, anything you'd have there to say, like, um, you know, if you're looking at just, you know, I, I know you kind of mentioned quality uh, condition, but like anything else, as far as the glaze, the glaze, the artwork, um, what, like, what are you looking at when you're evaluating a Hudson or a ocean? Yeah. I, I mean, you'll start, um, you know, looking at pieces and, and seeing what you feel is the best artistry on them. And then you'll notice, you know, there's certain artists and, or, and decorators, and you'll know those pieces just by looking at them, whether there's a signature or not. And, you know, you look at a Timberlake and nobody, nobody produced a Tim or a, a Hudson better than Timberlake. I mean, it was so thick, three dimensional. Um, the art artistry is just wonderful. Um, there, there's, I, I don't think I've ever seen a piece of Timberlake that I didn't think was exceptional. They're just, and that's May Timberlake, not her sister, yeah. because that's yeah. kind of the other end of the scale. Yeah. Um, but, but you just kind of, you know, connect with those certain artists, artists, and you can, and, and I think a big thing to, to, to say to those collectors is that, you know, before you start purchasing a lot of pieces and starting a collection, get out there and see as much as you can. Get as many books as you can find and read and see pictures. You really got to start handling a lot of different pieces. You know, handle, you know, 300 Hudson's before you decide, you know, after you handle 300 Hudson's, you'll know what, what a yeah. good Hudson is and what a not so good Hudson is. So it's it's really just getting out there and, and seeing as much as you can, and, and you'll get a better idea before purchasing. And then you'll kind of come up with maybe an artist that, that kind of suits you better and <laughs> some, someone you'd like to collect. Yeah, yeah, that's very well spoken. That, that's, that's great advice. Um, you know, you mentioned condition. I know you, you in particular, are very, very particular about condition. Um, so do you basically, if something's got a flaw in it, are you passing on it for your collection or do you consider damaged pieces or where, where does that fall in your, your uh, spectrum? That's a real, a real good question because, you know, I got to say I've made mistakes in the beginning of my collecting career too. I was such a perfectionist. I wouldn't buy anything with damage. And then I realized as, you know, I became a seasoned collector that there's some really nice rare pieces with, you know, a great application, whether it's carved or incised or a super glaze or whatever that I've passed up in the past because there was damage to it. And I've learned, you know, probably in the last 10, 10 years uh, and I like 10, 15 years, I've been collecting for 30, 37 and to, if it's a really rare piece and it has some damage that you can live with or you know you can get repaired, yeah. to, it's not too obtrusive, um, I'll definitely buy it. Um, I don't have a problem buying it. But, you know, again, I've seen enough pieces that I know what's really rare yeah. and something comes up, you know, it doesn't, in the beginning, when I first started collecting, it took an awful long time to decide, do I want to buy this or, I, or do I want to pass on it? I didn't have enough information in my own database. And now I can look at a piece and right away know to pull the trigger or not. 
um, yeah. because I've seen so much and, you know, I've researched and, and have all that knowledge base that I can make those quick decisions. You can't so that, as a being collector. Yeah. You, you kind of talk about it as a database. So it's kind of interesting. So I'm guessing the thought process is, does it fit in the collection because there's a, there's a hole or there's a gap or it's the right thing I want for the collection. Then what is the condition? And then what is the price? And if all those three things are saying go, then you go. If one of those three probably aren't, then you you um, don't. So I guess with condition, because uh, one thing I always try to tell my customers, my clients, like it's fine to buy damaged and repaired pottery. The key is, and a lot of people are worried about reproductions. Well, it's like, I'm like, okay. Like you mentioned, touch 300 pots. Well, touch 20 and you're going to know 99% of the reproductions. So I don't, I mean, I, I don't, I'm not worried about for my customers reproduction so much, but what I do strong, really, really worry about is condition issues. Cause I've, I've purchased collections that have been assembled and people were just completely misled. I and mean, they put together 150, 200 piece collections and 95% of them are repaired. And they're thinking 95% of them are meant, which again, if that's what you buy and it just, if it's factored into the price and it's priced accordingly, and obviously the lower quality pot, the bigger impact of damage. If it's a piece of Della Roby, it's an exquisite piece of Hudson and it has a little bit of a problem doesn't have much of an impact on value. If it's a lower quality pot, it's going to have a very significant impact on value. So I think that's one thing. Another thing I was just going to ask you real quick. So do you have a preference on, uh, cause one thing we do sometimes, if it's a, if it's a nice pot, it's got a little chip or something, I don't restore it. I leave that to, I say, look, I can get this restored for you. Here's what it would cost. Um, it's sent into our restorer. But like, I, I find more and more people would rather have the pot with the little nick or a little line or a drill hole rather than have those things restored. Do you have a thought process on what you're thinking about that? Yeah, I think that becomes more personal preference. And again, you know, the perfectionist in me would like to see it restored to look like it was perfect. Um, if, if it's got a hairline, like a tight hairline or something that, you know, is not really seen in the front of the pot going through the subject matter or something, um, then, I, I'm fine with that. But if it has a drill hole, if it has a chip off the back, um, if, if it has a chip on the a flat chip on the bottom, I'll, I'll let that go. Yeah. But anything that can be seen pretty readily when you're looking at that pot that would detract from looking at that pot, I would repair. Yeah. yeah but again, it, it's kind of personal preference. Some people are fine and would rather see something and say, you know, it shows that it's you know, a vintage piece of pottery and it's, it's had its yeah. usage and, and whatever. I, I'm a little different than that. Yeah. And that makes sense. And I think by word, I see a little bit of the skewing the other way is with me selling online. I like the idea like, look, when I say it's a, you know, it's a tip of a pencil size or a tip of grand size Nick, I want people to understand it's not a thumbnail size chip like this, you know, like, so then that way they kind of see it and they make their own determination. So that, 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 um, that kind of makes sense, I think too. Um, you mentioned, you know, you've made mistakes, obviously, and, and you're, you're a much more advanced collector than, than the majority of folks out there. Obviously you've been doing this for a long time and you really specialize very deep in Weller. Um, so like what, what, cause I remember when I started by, when I started buying Van Brigle, um, Lan and I were living in an apartment. We had one little case. When I got more than like to 10 or 12 pieces, when I made a purchase, I had to come back and I had to decide what's leaving the case and going in a box. So like it was this, this evaluation. And, and then, um, so this would have been back in 1997. And then at that point, I um, I sold a couple pieces on collect uh, that, well, it was it Antique Week or Antique Trader? The Antique Trader, yes. And then that, Somebody called to buy a piece. They mentioned eBay. I started on eBay early 97. And then um, we, you know, not by some great uh, knowledge or whatever at the time. We, I started a website. And I, our website started in 1997. So that was, you know, wow. looking back in time, I mean, that was a very good decision. And we were, you know, we still have some customers who are buying from us that long ago. But, but um, I guess where my question, where I'm going with all this is, you know, um, what would be advice or suggestions for folks that, you know, have maybe they're, they bought all this stuff and now, Hey, I really want to focus on higher end Hudson's or I really want to buy Rookwood scenic vellums, or I'm going to do early Van Bribble or whatever. And you, you sort of change collection interest. Like, um, 
what's your any comments or suggestions on upgrading your, your collection? Yeah, I, I think the first thing that I always looked at was um, market, um, what the value of it was on the market. You know, as I said, everything kind of ebbs and flows. And sometimes you you see a, a line that's really hot. And then the next time, you know, three months later, it's not. Always try and follow market, um, what is popular. Um, if you have something that, you know, you know, is is very marketable, then that's that's a good time to sell it. If you know it's at kind of at its low point, I would hold on to it. Um, but th there's different avenues to sell it. And, you know, you're right, eBay, you can always purchase on eBay. When I first started, I, I don't think there was any fee to purchase on eBay. And then it went to like 1% or something. And then it was up to 10. And now I think it's up to 13% or something. Um, but still compared to looking at auction houses and they're taking, you know, 25, 35%, it, it's yeah. just, and then shipping on top of that, it's just amazing, you know, the cost, what, what percentage they'll give to the, to the seller if they're, you know, taking a collection and giving it to that auction house. So, you know, I, I think there's different avenues that you have to vet and determine what's best for you. Um, someone, you know, a dealer comes in like, like yourself. I mean, that's a good avenue as well. Um, you know, they'll, they'll look at what they'll get from an auction house and then what you'll offer them. And they'll probably find out that you'll offer them more than what they're going to get from an auction house. So, so it really varies. Uh, there's, there's a lot of things to take into consideration. Um, yeah. But, but, you know, you don't, when you want to trade up, don't think of selling everything at once, you're going to lose yeah. your shirt. And, yeah. and, and cause you don't want to flood the market. If you have like one certain thing you collect and you yeah. put all these pieces out to auction, you have 30 pieces of, you know, this type of line or whatever with this type of pottery, you're going to flood the market and you're not going to get the prices you want. Um, so, so there's a lot of things to consider, I'd say. That's an ex that's a very good point. Like I was a couple of years, you know, I, like I started out in Van Brook, so there's that's probably been three or four years ago. I was made aware of a, about three thousand piece collection of Van Brook, and I went to look at it, and I I wasn't trying to be cocky, but I just I, I said, look, I'm gonna I'm gonna be the buyer of this collection. I said because there's no one else that's gonna buy this collection because no auction house is gonna take this. Or, or, or you'd be foolish to give an auction house three thousand pieces of Van Brook because. You're going to flood the market. They're not going to want to take the time. And it was, it was all, I mean, there might've been 150 early dated pieces, but that, that was a massive collection of early dated pieces. And there was tons of new stuff. There was, there was probably, uh, there was probably 50 figural like Lorelei's and despondencies. It was all over the board. Right. And um, it was just a collection that like I was, I, I, there was very few buyers because it was so big. And it was so diverse, or it was so, uh, such a wide range. And when you collect like that, thinking about the exit strategy is important. And I think I really like your analytical approach to this because I never really thought about that. But that's a very good idea. Just like if I'm going to sell my house, the real estate market's great. Now is the time to sell my house. And you know that you the same thing can apply to your collection if that's if that's appropriate for you. Because I I do find that somewhat regularly where there'll be a particular maker that I. I want this collection, but I'm also looking at it thinking it's going to take me five years to get rid of this because it's so much inventory of one particular maker that's maybe there's a narrower band of collector interest. And, you know, I think it's, I don't know if I, I mean, I guess the way I want to say this is it's in everybody's interest. It's in the market's interest and it's in us as pottery collectors interest to not see those collections just flat out flood the market because it, it helps it helps sustain the value for, for all of us. So, you know, um, I want to switch gear. I want to ask you something that I hadn't really thought about to just now. It's not in line with what it doesn't really flow where we're going to this, but I wanted to go back to the glazes a little bit. But what I wanted to ask you about is Weller's matte green, because I look at Weller's matte green and I'll like, I'll often be at shows and I'll have somebody looking at Groovy and Tico and, Roseville's Matt Greens and and I'll put a piece of Weller's Matt Green up there and I'm not just saying I mean not, you know I'm I sell everything so I, I I'm just giving my honest opinion but I look at a Weller Matt Green base and some of those architectural shapes I'm like why is this not more popular because it's a fraction of the price of a similar Tico or you know it's not, or, or any of the other you know arts and craft the more more well known arts and crafts makers so do you have any 
any thoughts on that at all? Like what, what's, what's the, like, do you, I guess, do you agree that Weller's Matt Green is like really, really good? I mean, or is it just a, maybe my preference? I'm thinking I really like this green or what, what's, what's your thoughts on that? You have to think about the time when, when Weller was making Matt Green, you know, you go back to the 1900s, 1905, 1906. Um, they had some of the best artists, modelers, decorators, art directors, you know, Sam, Sam went for the best and, and he had them. Um, that was the, the main years of Weller's production that they really produced some of the greatest lines and greatest examples. And they had the modelers, you know, they had the Radfords, the Lorbers. They, they had some wonderful, wonderful people employed at Weller at that time. And they did do high quality examples like you're talking about. So I, I think with, with Weller's Matt, Weller Mac Green, they, since it was a production or a commercial art pottery, I think a lot of people kind of look at that as a negative um, where, you know, there's more prestige if you have a piece of Gruby in your house or, you, you know, there's there's that association by name and by manufacturer. And, and Weller tended to do things because it was commercial, because it was commercial or, or production art pottery, they had to do it so quickly. They, they they had to produce in mass and not every piece came out wonderful. Um, they did have some problems. And yeah. you know, a lot of people say, oh, well, there's no QA process in Weller and they just throw them out there on uh, for sale and whatever. That's not the case. I mean, they did have a very good, I, I researched that, they did have a very good QA process. But what okay. they did, they took all the ones that had issues and they sold them at their pottery for a very low price for people that came to visit the pottery. They could go home with a wonderful Mac green piece that maybe had a, a glaze flaw or something on it. So a lot of those flooded the market because you got to think how many pieces Weller has put on the market between, you know, 1872 and 1948. There's just hundreds of th hundreds and hundreds of thousands of pieces of Weller pottery out there. But to, to get back to your original point, I think if you took someone that, didn't know anything about pottery and you yeah. took a real nice example of Weller Mac Green and you put it against, you know, some of the other better potteries, better as they yeah. say pottery. And, and I'm not de de denigrating those potteries. Yeah. They, they're wonderful. And they did some wonderful glazes and, you know, they, they did take more time and they are maybe high, a, a bit higher quality or whatever, but for the discerning eye for a beginning collector, if, if you line those up and told them, which one did you like the best? I don't think they'd pick the highest end piece all the time. I think, you know, they pick Weller pieces from yeah. time to time as well. Yeah. I, I mean, maybe people are just agreeing with me when I'm at a show, but I do that quite a bit at shows when I'm talking to like, you know, like newer people or some of my customers that have come and visit us at a show that aren't that folks that just don't go to shows and I'll line stuff up and we'll start talking about stuff. And like, I mean, there's a lot of people that really appreciate the Weller Matt Green line that I just don't think they, they, they understand that if they see it sitting side by side and like with a, with a piece of Tico or, or something like that. So anyway, I just wanted to ask you that because that was something that, that has always been. And it goes back to personal preferences too, For you sure. know, people have a, you know, a connection with a certain piece because sure. of a certain, yeah. And there's definitely a quality if it's a handmade piece of powder versus a multi piece of powder. Yes, I agree. That, that tips the scale for sure too. So um, I wanted to ask you about, so I, I don't want to get, I'm hoping to do another interview with you where we can delve much deeper for our more advanced Weller collectors going into the second book because there's a ton of information out there. But I do want to talk about one thing from, from book two. And that is the fact that what we've called Hudson Light for the past 40 or 50 years is the actually the ocean matware. So I have now, I think, I don't know if it was six, seven, eight pieces of Hudson, of formerly known Hudson Light has now been renamed Eocean Matt Ware, which I think would have been from 1915, I think, 15, 16, I believe. Um, so actually, actually probably started 1914. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, but so when people start asking me, I'm going to I'm going to direct them to this chapter of our interview. But I would like for you to just speak a little bit on that, uh, which sort of, I think, should kind of whet your appetite if, if you're listening today to like the research that Frank has put into this and and not to like degrade what other people have done prior to this, because it's it's it's, it's a continuum. Right. Like somebody researching uh, Weller back in the 1970s 
had a limited view under the crystal ball. And then you, you know, somebody comes along, we, we learn a little more information. So each, each subsex, so each follow on author takes it a little further, which is just the way it is in anything in the world, basically. Um, so if you would speak a little bit about that discovery, um, cause I think you found a certain number of shapes from that line and, and there's some good information there that we kind of wet their appetite with our, our viewers appetite for when we dive a little deeper into to round two of this. Yeah. Um, Hudson light's been a mystery and a, and a curiosity for me for a long time. I think early on, I wrote an article for the APA journal on Hudson light and really what is it? And it was, it was an initial, um, my initial thought process on Hudson light and is it really a line or is it something that collectors call this certain um, example? And, you know, I've, I continued to search and, and, and research and try and find out some information, look for a pot that had matte eosian or eosian matte on the bottom or something, a clue that would tell me exactly what this was. Because when that was produced, it was produced during the time frame when Sam Weller wasn't letting artists even sign their pots. He went from like 1914 to 1917, 18. And he said, you know, no other name will go on this pottery that leaves the, the Weller pottery except Sam Weller's name. I and, did not realize that. Yep. And that created uh, more of the mystery that you find all these pieces. You know, how many, how many mat eosians or eosin mats have you seen that have some type of a marking on the bottom? You don't. Um, very, very rare, um, which kind of leads me to how I discovered what it was. Um, I, I also collected a lot of ephemera. So any, any type of Weller factory information that came up on eBay or whatever, I, I was very fortunate. And this kind of leads into the Hudson Light one. Um, one of the um, individuals I was dealing with on eBay had listed a salesman's catalog from their grandfather. They were up in Buffalo, New York. And they, he was a salesman from you know, the 19 or 19 teens of with Weller. And he had all these catalogs that he would take out when he was selling Weller pottery and had all the lines listed at that time, what was available. It didn't have all the photos associated with it, but at least because, because there's always a, kind of a picture book that went along with the listings or photo plates as they would call them. And yeah. they, they didn't find those in the attic, the photo plates, but they did have the salesman's catalog that had all the documented information of each line. And, and when I received it and I was reading through it, I was just tickled to death that I was like going to get a list of in 1915 and 1916. I actually got the first one I bought 19 was a 1915. And then they told me, Oh, we've got another one. And I said, well, I want that too. Wow. So I, I was thrilled to get these catalogs and page through and see what Weller was selling at that time. And that would help clear up some of the mysteries of, of Weller pottery. And sure enough in there, I found a section that it was listed as Eosian matware. And I was like, okay, what's Eosian matware? So I started researching um, all their, they, they listed all the numbers in the catalog and the size and, and the yeah. decoration, the subject matter. And I started researching all of those and trying to match them up with examples of Hudson Light and what was called Hudson Light. And sure enough, it kind of matched up really closely to, to that catalog. I think I found like 22 out of 28 of the listings. Yeah. I think that's all in my second book. Um, so I, here I had that information, and but I still never had a marked piece that said, you know, Eosian matware. And then one day I was looking through auctions, um, always checking online every possible avenue to find out new auctions and what Weller pottery was available. And there was a piece, uh, it was actually a lamp base up in a, in a New England auction. And sure enough, they, they marked it as just a piece of Weller or whatever, or I don't even know if they even marked it as Weller, a piece of art pottery. And on the bottom in pencil, which Weller did a lot of in the factory, was Eosian matte. And I was like, bingo, now I've got an example. So I got that. I was going to take, I was going to buy that piece no matter what the cost. I got that piece that helped support my research. And that's how I kind of put the pieces together to, um, you know, change that thought process of everybody going from Hudson Light to Eosian Matt. 
And and one other thing I'll tell you is a recent finding. Um, you still have skeptics. You know, you find the piece yeah. that's in marked in pencil, the ocean mat, and they're like, oh, well, he could have written that on there. And, you know, if you handle enough Weller pottery, you learn that they were doing that in the factory. And you can even take acetone and try and go yeah. up to remove it. And it's glazed over. So, you know, you know, it came from the factory. Right. But I was always searching for a piece of the ocean that was the ocean mat that was marked the ocean. And sure enough, I just recently acquired a piece that is the ocean mat where, and it's marked the ocean on the bottom. I can show you that piece. Yeah, yeah. Um, if you can see this. And, and this is really an important piece, if, if you can yeah, see that. perfect, yeah. Um, because it's got a really, unusual and nice signature by Farrell on it. You see oh, that wow. up there? Um, yeah. And that's unusual for him. So it tells me that this kind of was a special piece, which I think was kind of like a prototype. Um, and, you know, we can get into it more when we talk about my second book, but, yeah. you know, Farrell, everybody thought left in 1904, 1905, but yeah. he came back to Weller. I found research that he came back to Weller and during this time frame, 1911, before he went to um, Peters and Reed. And I think this was one of his accomplishments. And if you look on the bottom, it's marked the ocean. Oh, wow. Yeah, I can see it. Yeah. It's, so it's incised the ocean and then Weller and yeah. blue. Yeah. So it's finally a piece that's incised that people can't question, you know, oh, was that pencil mark? Yeah. Added? This was incised at the factory, the ocean, and it is matte. Or ocean well, beautiful map. base too yeah yeah yes. it's definitely got to be some sort of prototype yeah and you know there was another piece i had found that's marked by claude leffler and it's got a date on the bottom too and it's during that time frame so i think he was involved at the same time because he did a lot of trial work for weller as well and i think he made kind of a prototype for this the ocean mat as well so yeah this was this was really a pleasing that's an awesome point. Point. And something that, um, you know, I want to get out there in an article or something as well. Yeah, yeah. No, that's very cool. Um, I have three more questions. I want to be respectful of your time, and I want to be respectful of our listeners' time. I have three more questions for you. First one, I want to backtrack to something you said about, which I did not know this, when you said about between 1914 and 1917, Sam Weller was not having any artists sign pottery. So one thing that people have asked me before, like you'll see a really nice Hudson, and it's not signed. Or you'll see something that's not signed. So what I, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but are you, are you, I, I guess, so is that because, so that, so if it's not signed, doesn't necessarily mean the artist wasn't very proud of that example. Is that fair or, or not? It, it's uh, totally accurate. Yeah. It, it doesn't lessen the example. I mean, there is the collector that is skeptical when they see a piece without an artist signature and say, well, it'll be worth a quarter more of, you know, what the value is now if it had an artist signature on it. Yeah. Yes and no, but I would say more no, because you, like I said, you handle enough Weller, you've seen enough Weller, you collect enough Weller, you know what the artists are, you know who the artists are. And I could pick up a Timberlake and tell you this is a Timberlake without any signature, but for the most part, hers were always signed. The, the ones that really weren't signed, you know, towards the end of that period, it was like 1914 to 1919. So that's when they released the Hudson line, like 1917. So those early white and decorated blue and decorated you don't oh. see signatures on them but yeah. you can look at the artwork on them and you can pretty much tell which ones timberlake yeah. was involved in um so again it's it's seeing enough pieces learning through you know handling touching reading um get that knowledge that that's what's key when in collecting that i would say to the end yeah. user yeah yeah, no, those are those are awesome points, and I, I really thank you for sharing that. So, uh, my last two questions for you, help me out with kind of these are these are my two most frequent questions that I receive. And the first question, I probably get this question once a month from somebody, like, why is this Weller? You know, it was a copper tone piece is marked. This this one isn't. This one is. This one isn't. The the forest base, you got two of oh, this one's marked. This one isn't. Those are the one and not marked the second. What's going on there? I just, my line has just pretty much been, look, about half, in my experience, about half those pieces are marked, half aren't. I don't see any, there's no difference in the quality. It, there was no, there wasn't like, this one was better, so it's going to get a stamp Weller mark. 
if you could comment a little bit on that, agree, disagree with me, just what, what you, what's the thought on why do we see such inconsistency within, you know, gla even to glaze lines with markings, like some's marked, some isn't, which I think contributes to some of the undervalue in a Weller because people are just confused. And I, I think help, hopefully you can help clear, clear that up a little bit. Yeah, I, I think I've touched on it a little bit that, you know, Weller, Sam Weller wanted to be a leader in art pottery and he wanted to create art pottery for the masses. And to do that, he had a lower, you know, send out a piece that was lower priced than a Gruby or a George yeah. Orr or a Rookwood or, or whatever. So he had to try and, you know, accomplish this task of getting art pottery out to the masses. And, and really what it comes down to is time is of the essence. And he had to produce this, you know, pottery as fast as possible to get it out there to, to the audience. And their production was, you know, you hear so many stories about their production where, you know, they, the artist had to put a, a number or something on the bottom because they tracked how many pieces they oh. decorated a day or, you know, so everything was time related. So oh. the, the real answer to that, and, and there's actually a couple answers to that, but the real answer to that is producing something in mass as they did. There's many inconsistencies as far as markings. And even early on, um, some of the earlier pieces, when you talk about, you know, the 1890s to the 1910s, when, when Weller hired a, a lot of individuals, they, they hired some, some, the, some of the best, as I said, um, modelers, artists, decorators, art directors, but they also hired a lot of, you know, factory workers. And at that time, there were a lot of imports coming in from Europe, a lot of immigrants. And everybody in Europe, you know, knew of the pottery boom in Zanesville. And they thought, let's go over to the US and get rich and then come back to our homeland, which by the way, not many of them have ever got rich with the prices they were paying in those potteries. But right. they came over and they couldn't write English. They could barely speak English or even understand English. They had to, you know, learn English when they came over here. So they, the, some of those workers were marking pottery on the bottom. And that's why you see some really unusual markings on the bottom of a piece, the, some of the early pieces of Weller. Yeah. It's like, They'll spell Weller wrong, or one piece of trial I had was spelled T R I L E. Um, uh -huh. So they didn't even know, you know, the English language. So you see a lot of inconsistencies that way. But but I think that the main reason is that it's just the volumes that they just kept producing volumes, and you know they used molds that you know had the Lu Luelsa stamp on the bottom, and yeah. it wasn't a piece of Luelsa, or they yeah. had. Dickens on the bottom of something that wasn't Dickens wear. And, and I think that confuses the initial collector. And oh, I yeah. think that's what says, well, I don't want to touch this. It doesn't follow into this formula of what a piece of Dickens should look like. Or, um, and, and it's, it's just a matter of learning, you, you know, the history of the pottery and, and, and you do that through reading, talking to other collectors, um, talking to dealers, you know, that have the knowledge of it, you, you just, it's, it's a learning experience. And, you know, I think that that's the, 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 but the answer I think I would give to most of your people asking that question is just the volumes that Weller put out yeah. that they didn't possibly, couldn't possibly keep up with marking everything correctly. But that Bald, Baldwin or um, Coppertone or Forest or Vase that's marked or not marked, from a value perspective, marking or not marking doesn't make a difference. You buy it, the quality of it, the size of it, and that don't worry if it's marked or not. No, and, and you can tell pretty easily whether, you know, there's how many forest reproductions do you find out there? There's there's there are reproductions out there, but more in the Roseville line. That's the right. one you'd be worried about for beginning collectors. But there's not a lot of Weller reproductions. There are Product reproductions. I won't say yeah. there are any, but once you've handled again enough Weller pots, you'll know that it's not a, a reproduction, and you'll see the quality of it. If it's a great piece of forest with great color, great mold, um, and it doesn't it isn't marked, that would be more valuable to me than a piece that's marked and had poor color yeah. and poor mold. Yeah, no, I, I fully agree, and hopefully that hope that clears up. So my last question for you, and I don't know if there's an answer to this, but I've always found this very interesting. I've had a lot of people ask me, and I was even talking to Linda Kerrigan at 
uh, the APA show a few weeks ago about this. So, uh, but this just comes up. A lot of people ask me this. You'll see a molded piece of weller that is maybe not a one-off, but it's like never seen that shape before. And it's, and why why is that? So like you know you see like your experimentals that are you clearly like are handmade one-offs, but like when you're you're you've got a mold, you've created a mold, but you've only you only see you know there's only a handful that are known to exist. Well, what's the story behind that? Yeah, um, when one one thing that you know when Weller Sam Weller died, his vice president said you know we spoke at his funeral and he said. You know, the, the great thing about Sam Weller is that he never turned down a suggestion. He had to fully vet that suggestion and, and find out that it really wasn't of a, a value to him before he would discard it. And so he was very open to experimenting and experimental pieces, but nothing like Roseville or some of the other ones that had, you know, fully documented experimentals. Um, Weller did a lot of experimenting, but they didn't even begin to get close to some of the other potteries that were documenting all this. Um, so what would happen is he might get someone come in with a great idea and he's like, okay, well, let's try this. And he had his certain, um, you know, modelers or, or decorators or artists that he would say, you know, go into this room and create this. And, you know, they would go in and come up, come up with this design and, and, you know, they'd say, okay, let's fire it. Let's see what it looks like. Yeah. So, it would come out and he'd take a look at it and then he'd have to make a decision. And I think what he based his decision on was if he was going to put this in mass production as art, mass produced, produced art pottery was a couple things. Number one, is it too costly to mass produce? Does it take too much time to mass produce when it's fired? How many pieces come out successful and, and what's the success rate, you know, is if it's only 25, 30% successful, then, you know, we're not going to do it. Yeah. Now, I know that kind of goes against the Saccard theory, but that's another whole or this topic for discussion. Yeah. Um, and, and also, you know, he had all these different showrooms and, and he wanted to see what the, people or the individuals he's selling it to, what the audience, if they like this, if it was popular. And, you know, maybe if it passed the first three criteria and, and now it comes down to the popularity. So he puts a piece up in New York and Chicago and Milwaukee and Washington, D.C. and Raleigh. And he, he has his salesmen, you know, show it in their showrooms there and see to gauge the desirability. If, if you know, people coming through really okay. like this mold and, and, and if it's not popular, then he's going to do, you know, maybe he's done a short run of it, but he's going to discontinue it. He's not going to continue trying to produce something that wasn't popular. So I think those are the main reasons. Okay. Um, but again, knowing the way he produced in mass and how quickly these pieces had to get out on the market, um, those first three are critical. If, if it costs too much, if it takes too much time yeah. or, yeah, or if the success rate is poor, he's not going to reap. So it boiled down to a business decision, basically. So it wasn't so much that, hey, I want a matte green candlestick with a serpent on it. And so, so somebody's going to create a mold for it for your one. It was like, hey, this is an idea. Let's make some of these. Let's distribute them out to our to the, the distributors you talked about. And if it gains some traction and there's some interest, we put it in the production. If not, we're switching gears and we're going on to something different. So it's just basically, it was basically more of a business decision than a way that they were making the pottery. Yeah. And, and to, to follow that point about a molded piece, you know, it might have, it might be a wonderful mold, but it might be really difficult getting out of the mold. And when they pull it out of the mold, it, you know, pieces fall off or, you yeah. know, there's, there's issues because it's too detailed or intricate to pull out of the mold. And, you know, that, that's, that's a consideration, you know, if we can't produce this in mass quickly and have all these problems coming out of the mold, we're not going to continue. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Well, Hey, I, uh, I feel like we've covered a lot of ground. I feel like, if you're interested in what, I mean, you've, you've added some wonderful tidbits and knowledge to, uh, to me that I wasn't aware of, and I'm sure other people got a lot of this as well. Um, I want to be respectful of your time. 
Is there anything else that you would want to feel I didn't ask about or anything else we want to share today? I, I, I definitely want to have you back and I want to do more deep dive into to your second book. But I mean, I think we've covered a lot of ground today. Is there anything we didn't talk about that you want to want to get out and let our listeners hear about? I, I think this was been, has been a really good meeting. I think you had some really good questions. And, you know, you know, one of my goals or one of the main goals for me is to get this information out to other collectors. And, you know, obviously we want to see art, just like the, the period animals. We want to see these new collectors come out and start collecting it. Just like with the animals, I wanted to propagate yeah. them out to other small farms and, and keep yeah. this, this, these going, keep pottery going. Yeah. Um, that, that's the main goal is to, to get people's interest up. You know, hopefully squash any fears they had of collecting because of, you know, some talk out there or whatever. Yeah. I, I think I, I think this this accomplished quite a bit and what I wanted to accomplish and hopefully what you wanted to accomplish. And I hope it's valuable to the audience. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I'm just going to kind of backtrack a little bit. Just and I, I don't know that, you know, all of this, but just kind of a little background. Of this. So. It was a year or two ago, somebody started saying, why don't you do this, Greg? And I thought, I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to talk. And then I started like shortlisting some names. You were on my shortlist. I thought, I'll hit Frank up. Frank, I, Frank will do this. Um, and I sort of, and as I started doing this, I'm, you know, I've got a whole bunch of people contact me. Hey, can I, I'll do one of these and a lot of, lot of interest. Um, so I thought, okay, give it a try. Um, helps get information out there. Because I think a couple of things. There's a lot of my customers aren't going to go to a show. They're not like there's no there's not very many shows to go to anymore. They're just not. And if there were, they're probably not going to go anyway. There's just and there's not like antique. There's just there's just fewer venues to get out and, and, and touch things. That's point one. Point two is not that many people are going to read a book, right? Like it's hard to get people's attention to read a book. I will say this though, your book one is very easy to read. It provides information. It's just not a picture book. Because even at some points, like, okay, it's a picture book. I can look online. I mean, there's good information, but your book one goes way, way beyond that. I know book two is loaded with information. It's getting people to sit down and read something like that and digest it. So I'm hoping to with doing these. And, you know, I can say, and I, I thank you for all the positive feedbacks we've been receiving. We've been receiving a ton of positive feedbacks from like customers and collectors and stuff and folks looking forward to this. I'm going to try to keep rolling these out. So I encourage you, if you know somebody I should talk to, the other thing I'm going to do, I got some not just uh, not just authors and researchers like Frank. I'm looking. There's some collectors that I'm going to be talking to that, you know, just the way they decorate with their pottery, just different different aspects to this to keep this interest going. Because um, I think, like, I mean, we don't keep, if we don't keep the interest out there, it, it, or we don't do things to build the interest, it, it's not in any of our interest. So um, I agree. I think it's a very good idea. I think it's a perfect medium for today's society the the younger individuals especially because they'll much rather watch something on video rather than trying to read something yeah and i'm trying to break it down frank we're still tweaking this but like um the last i just did one of these with mark latta um and we're try trying to have it like by chapter so almost down to like every three four minutes like you know you can click to this this section to get to minute 513 where we talked about you know, condition versus rarity or what, whatever it is. So trying to make it bite-sized pieces to, to, to make it as easily consumable as it can be. So anyway, I super appreciate you taking your time to do this with us. I can see some wonderful pots in the background. I think when we do the next round of this, we ought to like plan on, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll get, we'll get a good organization together, what we're going to talk about and let you show some of the examples um, of your collection because I think is awesome. So I appreciate you taking the time for, for doing this and um, we'll be in touch. Thanks, Greg. And I think it's you handled it very well. And I think it's a great process or project and I think you're doing very well with it. And I'm excited to see some of your other videos from some of the other collectors and authors. Thanks, Frank. I appreciate it.